Mark's a teacher at Spirit Rock, and he has taught insight meditation retreats since 1997 worldwide. He's passionate about nature and integrating meditation and the natural world, and he leads wilderness retreats internationally through Awake in the Wild retreats. Shall we go? He Come. Is... Highly recommend them. <laughs> He's the founder of the Mindfulness Institute and has brought mindfulness trainings, consulting, and coaching to companies, healthcare, and nonprofit organizations across North America. Co founder of the Mindfulness Training Institute, Mark runs year long mindfulness teacher trainings in the United Kingdom and the United States. A leader in the online meditation field, Mark has meditations with the New York Times virtual reality. I can't give you the app because it won't make sense, but if you go to the New York Times, you can find it, right? It's the NYT VR app, <laughs> that N makes any sense. Say it again. NYT, New York Times VR app. Okay. And you'll have the weird and bizarre experience of having virtual reality nature meditations on your iPhone. <laughs> We're living in a very paradoxical, weird age. <laughs> All right. He's author of Awaken the Wild, Mindfulness in Nature as a Path of Self-Discovery, and Make Peace with Your Mind, which is the topic that he's going to talk about tonight, and he does have books here that will be for sale after the talk. He lives in Sausalito, Marin, and likes nothing more than hiking, biking, and kayaking in the outdoors. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Great to see so many of you, some familiar faces and new faces. So um, what we'll do is we'll meditate together for a little while and then uh, I'll share some reflections on the theme of the book and then I'll open it up for some questions and at the end I'll stay behind if you have further questions and happy to also sign books. So just curious, uh, how many of you uh, meditate? How many of you have a regular meditation practice? Wow, oh, I'm in California, okay. <laughs> more or less everybody. <laughs> Good. Well, I won't say too much. Hopefully you'll know what you're doing. <laughs> I didn't say you know what you're doing. Okay. All right. Well, I'll say a few things then. <laughs> okay. So let's just take some moments to, we'll sit for about 15 minutes, not long. So wherever you've come from, letting that go and taking your seat. Letting yourself arrive in your seat, in your body. Feeling and sensing this very simple experience. Human being, being human, sitting, connected to the ground, to the earth, and to cell phones. And to nice sounds. <laughs> Sensing into the silence, stillness. And 
being curious of what's here in this space of awareness, in the silence. Tending to the movement, to the sensations of breath. So feeling and sensing the immediacy of the body, the immediacy of the breath, as it changes moment by moment. sitting with an attitude of welcoming and of curiosity to whatever's here, to whatever's being known, sensations, breath, sounds, emotions that come and go, thoughts that flicker. present moment to moment to our unfolding experience. when our attention drifts from this moment, being curious, where does it go? And re-establishing awareness over and over here, just this.
These last few minutes of the sitting, no matter how far the attention wanders, only a moment to resume awareness here. And also being curious, since the topic tonight is the inner critic, noticing if the tone or flavor of the thoughts of the mind is judgmental. For some of you, that was a power meditation, shorter than normal. So I want to thank Insight San Diego and all the others who have helped this uh, event happen in the Unitarian Church. Uh, very happy to be here. So I'm in the middle of uh, a book tour, which are rare things these days, since usually book tours happen in bookstores and well, we know what happened to those. So um, anyhow, I'm on an I'm a, I'm a Insight Meditation book tour, DC, New York, San Diego, and tomorrow LA. And um, it's been fun. It's been fun talking about the book and sharing uh, some thoughts and reflections and hearing other people's reflections and also seeing, you know, having travel around the country talking about this theme, uh, how, you know, how global it is really. And, you know, one of the reasons that I wrote the book is I've been teaching for um, close to 20 years now uh, and also been a therapist and a coach. And one of the things that I see uh, as the most... Um, insidious forms of uh, self-created suffering is the way that we talk to ourselves, the way that we're harsh with ourselves and critical, judgmental, uh, and, and set ourselves in possibly high standards, and therefore end up feeling a little bit miserable as a result. So I thought, given my own practice and uh, uh, training in, in, in Buddhist teachings and mindfulness that it seemed like it would be useful to share some uh, techniques and methodologies for working with a critic. There's, there's a fair few books already out there on the critic, um, but not from this particular perspective that I am coming from, which is mindfulness and compassion, which I think are two key ingredients and essential both for life and for practice and uh, waking up, but also for working with the critic. So um, uh, the book came to me uh, for that reason, and um, yeah, and because I, you know, I have a little bit of a critic myself, you know, just just a little bit um, for a little while. <laughs> Anybody got a critic here? Anybody hard on themselves? 
Anyone judge the yeah, Okay, just just checking. I've got the right planet. Okay, good. Uh, I mean, I occasionally meet people who don't have much of a critic, and maybe some of you have done a lot of work on yours, and it's gotten quieter. Sometimes, as we age, it gets quieter, but not always. Um, but most people have some variation of a critical, judgmental, uh, internal killjoy. So uh, I like to ask people wherever I go, what are your names for the critic? Because when we hear a lot of different names, it can give a little, it gives a little uh, refraction of the lens of the different facets of, of the critic. So um, what do you call your critic? Anybody just shout out? What name? Mom. Mom. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting. So I, I've given this talk a lot. And I ask this question a lot, and I've been teaching this theme for years. And I have to say, the, the, the one consistent name that comes is Mom. And very rarely is it Dad, which is interesting to me. You know, I would have, I would have thought more Dad, you know, critical father type. But, it, you know, I hear, I hear Mom very consistently. <clears throat> what else? <laughs> All right, just to balance things out. Good, thank you. <laughs> Mm. Ego. Mm -hmm. The drill. Drill sergeant. Yes, that's a good one. The drill sergeant. Yeah. What was up there? Morticia. Okay. <laughs> yes. Someone shouted back that I missed it. Thinking. All right. Particular kind of thinking. Yeah. Any other? Any other words? Miss Perfect, yes, the perfectionist voice. Yeah. yeah. My favorite has been the itty bitty shitty committee. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that because, you know, as you know, it's not just one voice in there, it's a whole tribe of them giving you, you know, you have the fashion coach and you have the CFO financial critic and then you have the you know, the housekeeper tyrant, and you have the, you know, aging, you know, bully, and, and there's a whole bunch of them. You know, I, I once giving a talk uh, on retreat, and I said, you know, so this one person said, <coughs> it's like living with a bad college roommate who follows you around, you know, tells you you're a slob, and you haven't done the dishes, and you look terrible, and... And then later this, uh, someone else said, you know, it's not like a bad roommate. It's like having a whole college dorm. You know, there's a whole cluster of them with their views and opinions. So, or an inner boardroom is another way of talking about it. Other names that I like and I've heard, inner saboteur, I think is a good one. Uh, the bully, uh, the tyrant, which is a bit like the drill sergeant, taskmaster, uh, the underminer, killjoy, um, is that sparking any others? Big brother. Big brother. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you get a sense of the different qualities, right? Like, and so the question is, you know, is this someone you want to hang out with? <laughs> is this someone you want to invite for dinner? Not really, but we do. We invite them for breakfast, dinner, and tea, and walks, and work, and gardening, and hiking, and everything else that we do. Well, we might not invite them. They're actually a little sort of intrusive. <laughs> but we do somewhat give them a place at the table. And we give them a microphone or a megaphone. <laughs> and we let it uh, speak to us or shout at us or bully us or bemoan. Oh, beautiful flowers. Um, ceaselessly which is an interesting phenomena. And one of the things I invite you to reflect on today, is, as I'm talking and varying, giving various different facets about the critic, is what is your relationship to it? Do you listen to it? Do you believe it? Do you think it's true? Do you give it a lot of attention? Yeah, these are these are important questions, just like with any part of our mind. You know, how do we relate to it? How do we relate to anything? Right? That's the the key component 
from the context of uh, these teachings is, is freedom depends on how we relate to experience. And if we're listening to a, a tyrannical, distorted voice, not saying whose voice that is, but you know who I mean. Now, if you're, if you're listening to that internal voice, um, you will most likely suffer quite a lot. So, um, how many of you come here through the context of mindfulness and Buddhist practice? Is that, is that your sort of doorway? Okay, good chunk of you, yeah. All right, so in the, in the Buddhist tradition, there's a story of the Buddha who's um, aspiring to wake up, to uh, understand himself and life and reality. And in the night of his enlightenment, so the, the, the story goes, he's, he's battling with his own inner demons and, and, and his own consciousness. And this voice that's talked about as Mar, which is a personification of, of delusion, comes and speaks to him. And as the Buddha, is, you know, it's like this pivotal moment of him understanding things, and this voice comes and says, as he's about to attain full enlightenment, who do you think you are to attain full awakening? By what right do you have to sit in this seat of awakening? Does that voice sound familiar? Who do you think you are? You know, I hear that's a very common uh, thing said to kids in England, precocious children. Who do you think you are? You're too big for your breeches, too big for your boots. Be seen and not heard. And the Buddha, wise enough not to get into an entangled argument with this part of his mind, said, nothing. And then touched his, touched his hand to the earth. And, um, and said, the earth is my witness. The earth is my witness. The earth has seen and uh, I have every right to be here as a human being to wake up just as we have every right to be here in this moment in our bodies, in our lives and to wake up. Right? That we have inherent goodness and value and worth right? just by the very fact that we're born into this life. And we may feel that as we come into this world and then through various conditioning and other things we lose sight of that. And instead we, we uh, hear this voice that, that has various ways of telling us that's not so. Right? So one of the ways the critic manifests is this mantra of not being enough. Right? The not enough mantra. We live in this very interesting time where we're swimming in abundance and drowning in scarcity. Swimming in abundance and drowning in scarcity, whether it's ourselves or our material possessions or our accomplishments, you know, just like when Rockefeller was asked, how much is enough money? And he said, one more dollar, one more dollar. Right? So when we listen to the voice of the critic, it's oriented towards that which we're not that which we were not, not enough of, right? And who doesn't have some version of that mantra? That you're not enough at, at something. Not smart enough, not wise enough, not a good enough parent, not secure enough financially or whatever it is. Right? And what we want to understand about the critic is as in that, the boardroom, it wears many hats. So maybe you uh, come into the meditation world and suddenly you're not a good enough meditator or you're not, you're not mindful enough, you're not compassionate enough or you're not generous enough. And then you go to work as a graphic artist or a, as a physician or as a nurse or as a who knows what and suddenly you're not good enough in your job. And then you come home and pick up the kids up and you remember you're not a good enough parent. And then you go home and you burn the dinner and you realize you're not a good enough cook and on it goes. And you go to the gym later and you're not fit enough, you're not smart, healthy enough. 
So notice how the critic will follow you and can undermine your value, your worth. And as someone said earlier, the, the, it, it comes as the, as the voice of perfectionism. Have you ever met anybody who's perfect? That'd be really dull. <laughs> Human beings are not perfect. We're perfectly imperfect. We we are as we are, with all our mess and foibles and dramas and quirks and idiosyncrasies, which makes us interesting. Imagine if we were all perfect; it'd probably be very dull. <laughs> so, what are we, other ways does the critic manifest? Sometimes it manifests as it looks back at our past with twenty twenty hindsight. Anybody critic that's always on your case about what you coulda, woulda, shoulda done? Around money, around career, around relationships, around you name it. It's easy to look back and go, oh, of course I should have taken that road and that path and that stock and this job and that person, not that person. And, um, and we're human and we do the best we can uh, as with all the information that we have to hand. So I want to read this quote from Maya Angelou, because I think it really speaks to this um, phenomenon. She says, it is very important for every human being to forgive herself or himself, because if you live, you will make mistakes. It is inevitable. But once you do and you see the mistake, then you forgive yourself and say, well, if I'd known better, I'd have done better, and that's all. But if we hold on to the mistake, we can't see our own goodness in the mirror because we have the mistake between our faces and the mirror. We can't see what we're capable of being. And I love that. What do we have between ourselves and the mirror? Right? What are we looking at that, that we're letting define how we are and who we are? Right? What do we fixate on? What regret? What thing? What thing we said or did or didn't do that we're on our case for and we don't have forgiveness? So one of the things we start to see as we look at the critic is how distorted it is. Right? It's one of the things I try to impress upon people is the critic is a point of view. It's an opinion. It's a bunch of thoughts about you and what you've done that's a point, that's a perspective. It's just one way of looking at things that we tend to ascribe objective truth. Of course, we know there's no such thing really as objective truth, but um, we give it this voice of authority. And one of the things I like to do on, on the workshops I, I do when I have longer time with people is, um, is I have people write their, their judgments down and then I have them share them with each other which always sends a ripple of terror around the room. My God, you want me to share my darkest, deepest, embarrassing secrets about myself? And then what people find is, oh, we've kind of got the same ones. I have that one, you have that one, I have that one. It's all, kind of a, it's all, of, a, it's all of a piece. And then I ask them to share them with people when they go home. Share them with your loved ones, your spouse, and ask them, is this true? Is it true that I'm stupid or unworthy or unlovable or a mess or a failure or whatever the story is about yourself. I mean, that might be more subtle than the things I've just said, but some version of. And I would guarantee that people who know you and love you wouldn't agree with that. They wouldn't think you're a mess or stupid or unlovable or a failure. So if you're brave, go home tonight. <laughs> Write down your top 10 judgments and share them with someone who knows you really well, a good friend. And say, is this, is this true? Is this accurate? This voice that I'm listening to, is this really something I should be listening to? So basically the critic's saying, it's not okay to be who you are. It's not enough. which is kind of difficult since you are as you are. You, know, you are human, you have foibles. So another way the critic manifests is what I call in the book the swing door of the critic, 
where what we do inside, we do outside, what we do outside, do inside. So if we spend all day judging ourselves at home, when we leave the house and go to work or whatever we do, guess what we do? We carry on that habit of judging and nitpicking and fault finding and and if, or if we take great pleasure in judging others, which we often seem to do. Right? Anybody like ju- ju- judging others? We might not admit to it publicly, but we do. We are sitting in a cafe or on a bus, and we just we have a comment about every single person who walks by. Too short, too tall, too scruffy, too smart, too whatever, loud, too quiet, too boring, too loud. We just seem to have this slightly perverse pleasure. But the problem with that is that we, if we do that, we strengthen that habit. And as we know from neuroscience, what wires together, what fires together, wires together. And so if we're laying down these deep neural pathways of judgment and of nitpicking and in fault finding and being judgmental and critical all the time, that's what we become. And the question is, is that what you want to become? Because we have a choice. We have a choice in any moment we want to orient towards what's good, what's wholesome, what's positive, what's beautiful, what's creative? Or do we want to orient towards faults and deficiencies and flaws? We have a choice in any moment. You come into this beautiful auditorium and you can find fault, because you can always find fault with anything. Or you can look at the beautiful flowers and go, wow, beautiful tropical flowers. How amazing, orange is a color. Where does the mind orient? One of my favorite lines of the Buddha, he said, whatever the mind frequently dwells and ponders whatever the mind frequently dwells and ponders upon, that becomes the inclination of the mind and the heart. Right? So where are you inclining your mind? Are you inclining the mind to goodness? Or are you inclining the mind to, to criticism? Right? And that's, that's our choice and that's a practice. Right? We may have inherited a very critical mindset from our family, from our culture that we grew up in, but that doesn't have to define who we are. So, and that is the good news about mindfulness, it's the good news about practice, it's the good news with neuroplasticity, is we can change the nature and structure of our habits and our brain through what we pay attention to, through what we uh, choose. So one important distinction that I emphasize in the book and in this teaching is understanding the difference between a judgmental thought and, and I'll say, I'll define what I mean by that in this context, and all the other kind of critical faculties we might have that are necessary for for life, you know, in in your work, in your life, to making decisions, in, in assessing things. We need, we need a good critical faculty to, to assess choices, whether it's voting or looking at our meditation. We need a really critical one with voting. I'm not sure we applied that one too well recently, but anyhow. Um, you know, anything we do, we, you know, if we want to improve and understand and grow and develop, you know, we're using a, a, a discriminating, discerning, uh, evaluating attention. Right? So, with our meditation, we might at the end of the meditation, we might look back and just kind of just assess. Oh, well, that, that, that meditation was particularly focused, or it was very distracted, or I was busy, you know, obsessing about something at work. And that's just a simple assessment. The critic comes in and says, well, that was just useless. I mean, it was just pathetic. I mean, you were just all over the place. And I don't know why you bother. I mean, you know, you couldn't do yoga now. Look at, look at you in meditation, it's just the same. <laughs> you should try qigong or something. You know. <laughs> Swimming. I know. So the difference between those two kinds of critique, one is critiquing the, the activity, one is critiquing the person. Right? The critiquing the activity, you know, what happened in the meditation is just a you know, neutral, some, a neutral assessment. The judgment comes in and implies something about your basic worth as a person. As in, you were distracted and not very focused, therefore you're a bad meditator and a bad person and hopeless. Right? And it's not that gross in, in its thought structure, but that's the implication. 
that we let we, the net result of that is we feel a little deficient or bad or, or less than. And if we do that enough times with enough things in our life, that leads to this uh, compounding sense of um, deficiency, okay? not enoughness, <clears throat> which is very painful. Okay? In the same way that, I, that we might, uh, the way children uh, in, internalizing whether they're a good boy or a bad boy, or a good girl or a bad girl. Because okay? we use that languaging, and what gets internalized uh, often is that sense of, oh, if I, rather than some particular thing I did that wasn't very nice or kind or wise or smart, it was something about me and therefore I'm a bad person. Right? Very easy to internalize that. So, and we might ask, why do, why, do, why do we have these critics? You know, it seems to be a pervasive mechanism and structure. You know, and Freud talked about it back in, you know, a long time ago. He talked about the superego, this necessary part of the ego structure that is, uh, you know, it's really a survival mechanism that helps us survive our, our family of origin, right? We need to be able to fit in. Each child needs to fit in uh, with their family, with their parents, with the, with the society norms. And so infants have to, have to shut down a lot, of, a lot of things that aren't welcome, like rage or lust or jealousy or anger. Or, you know, we're we, we, we forced to kind of close it down so we can maintain that stream of love and affection. Right? Very important as, as infants. We're very dependent, very vulnerable. So when that vulnerability is threatened, the, the superego, the critic, comes in and, and closes us down, makes us fit in, makes us be good boys and girls. And in adolescence, that continues. We, you know, we want to fit in with our peers, very strong peer pressure, and so that voice continues. And then we leave home, and we, you could say we no longer need that. We can do whatever we want, but of course we've internalized that voice. And so we don't need mom and dad or priest or whoever it is that's telling you how you should be, we're doing it to ourselves. To any risk of vulnerability, we clamp down on ourselves. We shame ourselves. Oh, it's such a joyful topic. To, next, next book's going to be about happiness and, you know, bunnies and kittens or something. <laughs> So it's important to have a sense of humor, because, you know, especially about ourselves, because we're pretty wacky. You know, we want to be happy, and we often do things, a lot of things that get in the way, like beat ourselves up. Um, and it's also good to be able to have some lightness with these judgments. You know, one of the ways I've, be, I think, most been most effective with my own critic is um, through. Uh, being able to laugh at myself and laugh at the critic, you know. So, um, <laughs> so I t so I tend to be quite forgetful, and I, lo I and I mislay things frequently, and I'm often teased about that because, like, I'm a mindfulness teacher, right? Mindfulness people are supposed to be mindful and present, and you know, there's some implication that one shouldn't leave things, you know. I just consider myself a generous person, and I leave all kinds of things. My hat at the airport the other day, my water bottle, who knows where, my thermal cup on the airline, you know, just passing it on, you know. <laughs> my partner has a few other ideas about that, but that's a different story. Um, so, you know, and I, can, I, can, I could be down on myself. You know, I was, I was looking for my phone. I was convinced I'd left my phone at Whole Foods, and, um, and I had all these this jacket on, I couldn't find it, and I was like, oh, I gotta go back to the car, where's my phone, I can't see it anywhere. All right, it's here, all right, okay, yeah. So, you know, my critic could have a few things to say about that. But I preempt it by saying, Mr. Mindfulness wins again. Mr. Mindfulness beats the, <laughs> wins the day. You know, when I'm losing, when looking for my keys on my way to teach a meditation class. So, you know, we all have our quirks and idiosyncrasies. Mine is I'm a little forgetful. Does that mean I'm not mindful? I don't think so, actually. Um, 
Maybe it's because I don't care that much about stuff. Um, or I've got other things to pay attention to. I don't know. But anyhow, I'm not going to defend it. But, I, but what's important is I'm able to, 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 is to laugh about it and to preempt the critic's predictable revving up. Right? We all have our places that our critic gets a little noisy. Right? Maybe it's around your parenting or grandparenting. Maybe it's around the way you look, you know, you, you look how the way how you look in the mirror, you know. Maybe it's um, how you meditate. But we want to see where the critic uh, arises, so we have some chance to uh, navigate it, and so it doesn't, we don't let it land. So the, the the key distinction with working with the with the critic is. Um, well, what one distinction is um, uh, defending versus engaging. So normally we engage with the critic, as in we give it attention, we have a debate with it. The, the critic judges us like it could judge me for losing something, um, and, I, and, I, and, and I would I could get into engaging, and engaging means I start rationalizing. That's our most common defense. No, no, no. I mean, I I haven't lost that. I've had that cup for six months. <laughs> <laughs> really, I've been really good at holding onto that cup. It's only because I was traveling and tired. That's just a lost argument. Like, don't bother. Like, as soon as we start arguing with our critic, we've lost. One, because it's tenacious and we'll never let you we'll never let you win. Two, what's more important is we've bothered to give it the time of day, and three, we've bothered to give it authority. I don't care what the critic says, and it's irrelevant what its assertion is. We want to hear it and not be bothered and not give it any attention. So we're not engaging with it. We see it, we notice it, we notice the effect. Oh, thank you. I didn't know that I lost my cup. Thank you for telling me. And I lost what last week? Oh, that too. Okay, good. I'd forgotten I'd lost that. <laughs> thank you for your opinion. Have a nice day. And you let it go. Right? Just like you let all the other random thoughts go. So it doesn't land, right? We want, to, we want to find ways to stop the judgment landing in a way that causes a sense of collapse. So the critic manifests in different ways, thoughts mostly, but once the thought is landed and it's a view that we believe, it affects us physically. We might kind of feel a little kind of lethargic. It might, we might affect us mentally. We feel often dull and foggy brained. We might feel emotionally kind of hopeless. It affects different levels. So a good example of this is uh, when I'm writing. I love to write. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I might start off the day writing very excited and, and happy. I've got three or four hours to write, and it's just such a joy. And um, so I'm writing away. And then, and then I notice, and I'm remembering a conversation with a friend yesterday about I gave them my chapters, a chapter to read, and they'd said something critical about something. And I'm writing away, and I'm that, that thought's bumbling around, and I start to feel a little foggy, and then I start to feel tired, and kind of heavy, and a little blah, and like, I don't know why I'm writing. I can't write. This is hopeless. This is stupid. Who wants to read this anyway? And, I, and then I might wake up and go, wait a minute. I was really excited about writing. I was really enthusiastic and jazzed, and suddenly I'm collapsed. What happened? And if I, if I trace it back, I realize that thought sowed the seed of self-doubt, like, oh, that person doubted your, you know, or said something critical, and now it so, sowed the seed of self-doubt, which leads to, you know, kind of collapse, right? So we want to understand how the critic manifests and can create that sense of fatigue or dullness or fogginess or lethargy, and, and trace the thought, try and find if you can't find the thought, what would the critic be saying if it was if it was talking? Oh, right, you can't write, you can't sing, you can't draw, you can't parent, you can't whatever it is that's going on. So the subtitle of the book, How Mindfulness and Compassion Can Help Free You From the Inner Critic. So we need these two qualities, as I said earlier, mindfulness to to notice our thoughts, right? Without awareness, we can't see our thoughts, we can't be aware of them, we can't uh, notice the tone of them. Like notice when you're meditating and you space out and you come back, what's the tone of that, th of that coming back? Like, get back, stupid. 
right? Just space out again, you're thinking. Right? Or is it just, oh, thinking, well, whatever, come back. Right? Notice the tone. Right? My, one of my teachers, Joseph Goldstein, used to ask me to count the judgments in a day. So just, just like tomorrow, count how many judgments you have of yourself, of others, of the world, of politics. 123, 459, 863. Yeah, at some point it gets ludicrous. You just think, well, this is a really unhelpful monologue. So, and it's important to, to with mindfulness, we see the judgment, we name it, oh, judging, right? When we're, when we're, we're isolating and highlighting that, that judgmental thought that's, that's diminishing our value. Just the idle thoughts about, oh, I don't like this great carpet and, you know, whatever, maroon chairs, not my cup of tea. That's, they're, they're idle, but it's the thoughts that are attacking our worth. You want to, oh, you want to really want to pay attention. Oh, that, that's the critic. That's what he was on about. That's what I want to see and notice and not give attention to. Sometimes the critic is saying something that's true. Sometimes. And we don't have to, de- we don't have to defend the, 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 the I mean, just because it's true doesn't mean the critic has right to tell us 50 times a day. And yeah, maybe you forget to call, you know, beloved family member on their birthday or, you know, some anniversary or whatever it is. You know, things happen, life gets busy. You know, yeah, you forgot to call your mother on her birthday or you forgot, you know, it was your anniversary. Stuff happens. Okay, so you make amends, you learn. The interesting thing about the critic is it stymies reflection and inquiry, right? which is an essential part of meditation practice and life and learning, right? So for example, let me give an example. So um, uh, say, say you, got, you got into an argument with somebody and um, you got really reactive and you said something hurtful just came out of feeling defensive, and that person was really hurt and they left. Not an unusual situation, right? We get triggered, we say things we regret. The critic will come in and and shame you for doing something harmful. Oh, you're a bad person, how could you say that? That person's so hurt, I can't believe you were so insensitive. And that kind of shuts down the system. And there's no learning from that. It'll just, you know, there's a, there's a great line, of, if I can find it. Um, it's from Janine Roth. For some reason, we are truly convinced that if we criticize ourselves, the criticism will lead to change. If we are harsh, we believe we'll end up being kind. If we shame ourselves, we believe we'll end up loving ourselves. Good luck. It has never been true, not for a moment, that shame leads to love. Only love leads to love. So we think if we just beat ourselves up and criticize and judge ourselves, we won't do that again. All that does is create the such shutdown in the system. What we want instead is actually to be curious, like, wow, what happened? You know, I love this person, but I got triggered, and I said something like, what, why did I get so defensive? Why did I get so reactive? Where did that hurtful thing come from? Was I feeling scared? Was I feeling angry? Was I feeling self-righteous? Right? The more inquiry we, we can bring to our experience, the more we're going to learn, that's what's going to help us not uh, act it out again. But the judgment just shuts the system down and we don't learn, so we actually re, re, repeat that cycle. <clears throat> so the other piece of the, the subtitle, how compassion can help free us from the critic, right? With compassion, right, it says friendly, kind, responsive heart, right? The critic is painful, right? It's, it, to, to, imagine you, had, you gave your critic to somebody and you said, hey, just tell me these things, these, these top 10 things that I tell myself every day. Just walk around with me for, you know, today and just, you know, tell me that I'm stupid and I'm a failure and useless and I'm ugly and whatever it, your critic's on your case about. How long would you let them talk to you like that? Like a minute? Like 10 seconds, at some point you just say, stop, like, no, that's not helpful, that's not very kind, and you, I don't need to hear that, and it's actually not true. Right? But we let that voice 
you know, just grind us down. A big shift for me happened in my own practice was when um, I was, I'd been on my case about something and uh, instead of listening and being an ally with the critic, which we normally are agreeing, yes, yes, I'm a bad, terrible person, I actually just started to feel how painful it was to be on the receiving end of that judgment. Right? In the same way when someone judges and criticizes, it hurts usually, especially if we love the person, care about the person. And imagine if they did it for all day, right? It would feel bruised and brutalized. Right? So when I felt how bruising it was to talk to myself like that, it's like something shifted. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to support this pattern. I don't want to give this voice such free reign to hurt myself. Like, and so that's a really important distinction when we start to see that actually talking to ourselves is actually violent. It's harmful. It's painful. It, it creates a kind of a wound or, of sorts. So that's where the compassion is. Sometimes the compassion is fierce and says, no, stop. I'm not going to listen to that. That's not true. It is not helpful. Not accurate. Go away or whatever expletive you'd like to use, but you know, I'm in church, so being good. <clears throat> and actually, I think what the, the most profound antidote to the critic is the, the practice of loving kindness, or metta, which the Buddha taught thousands of years ago and is uh, having a current revival, I would say, in the West, um, because we, we, we're so deficient in self-regard, we're so deficient in self-love that it's, the practice has become very popular because it's, an, it's just as mindfulness is becoming popular to counteract the crazy constant partial attention we live in, the meta practice is there's a need for that because of how harsh we are with ourselves. And so the more that we can cultivate kindness, friendliness, love, self-acceptance, self-compassion, warmth, forgiveness, okay, we're bolstering up this reservoir of goodness and kindness that's in direct antithesis to the critic. Right? And ultimately, I think, will be the, the, is the thing that how allows the impact of the critic to really wane. Because the more that we can actually love and cherish ourselves, the less that voice makes any sense or any, has any relevance. And then, you know, just to, to wrap up here, um, you know, what I've seen working with people over the years, and, and I've worked with a lot of people around this theme, is that people, once we actually give it attention and turn our, our, our lens of awareness towards it, we can actually make quite profound shifts in relationship to the critic, whether it's using humor or awareness or compassion or love or fierceness or discrimination, or inquiry, inquiring, is this really true? Is this really true? I'm not a, a, a lovable person. Right? When we start to use some of these strategies, we can actually find a lot of peace, and ultimately, we learn to become uh, uh, disinterested uh, in the critic. The critic starts to, we have a little more Teflon mind with it, starts to rub, wash off without actually landing. So the critic may never go away necessarily. Sometimes for some people it really does diminish. Um, but it's more that we have a freer relationship to it. We can, we can find a sense of humor. We can laugh. We can let it go. We can find a sense of place of self-cherishing rather than self-hatred. So um, I'll close with this line from Oscar Wilde, which I really like. He says, to love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong love affair. So may we learn to love and cherish ourselves and see ourselves as we are in all the goodness and the beauty that we are. So that's enough words for me, but I am curious if there are any questions or uh, observations from your own practice or anything that you'd like me to perhaps share a little more. Any questions? Yes, in the middle here. <clears throat> uh, 
So uh, right in the middle of the talk, you said something about when you just feel deflated and sort of tracing your thoughts back. And I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that, because I actually don't hear a critical voice <coughs> as words. Um, it is more, it's very globalized. It's like mm -hmm. the atmosphere, sort of, a, <coughs> sort of a downer atmosphere. And it's, yeah. and it's really hard to know where, what triggered that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's not, it's, and it's not uncommon, that phenomenon. So w it's what I call tracing back the thought, which is, so say you're in that generalized state of, I forget the word you used, was it collapse? Um, what did you call it? Generalized state of deflation. deflation. Um, so what I try and do is, is think about what would my critic be saying that's led to the deflation? If, I could, if the deflation could be verbalized in words, what would it be? And maybe it's like, oh, I'm, I'm hopeless. Or, you know, I'm no good at whatever the thing is I'm doing. Or, you know, you could, you've got, I'm sure you've got your own. So you, ju you just try and verbalize either the physical state, the emotional state, the energetic state, the mental state, or some conglomeration. And, then, and, you, and you guess, but the, the guess is actually usually pretty accurate. Because we're, we we're intuitive, so we kind of know. Just we may not have it articulated yet. And, and then from there you go, okay, so, so I'm stupid. Okay, that's interesting. I'm stupid. Well, and, then we, and then we do some inquiry. Like, oh, is that really true I'm stupid? Well, I got my master's degree in clinical psychology, so, well, I'm not sure if that quite fits. I mean, I still could be stupid with a master's degree, but um, I have written a few books, so, um, yeah, I'm not sure that's really true. So, thank you very much for your opinion, and um, I'm going to get back to my writing now. <laughs> and, and again, there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no instant panacea for these things, but... We want to start, you want to start feeling into what, what, what are these, you know, what are the views? Because really a view, what is the view underneath that conglomerate state? And then, because and then the view is easier to work with than the energetic state. I mean, if, the energy, if that doesn't shift, you know, like if I'm riding and I'm in that, you know, I get up and I hike, you know, do something physical, go outside, take in the beauty, and then you know, shift the energy, have a cup of tea, call a friend, and, and then come back to it. So sometimes, sometimes something just says, if it's physical energetic, I want to move the energy out. Oh. Yes? You mentioned that uh, my perception of what you're saying is that when the critic speaks, you, you find a way to get, manage it and, and go beyond. What about the positive enforcement of the critic and how do you uh, address the fact that maybe there's a positive motivation there and how do you separate where the positive motivation is and or when you discount it and, and move on? Yeah, good. I'm glad you asked that. <clears throat> so, no, I, I hear this a lot that people will say, in the way that you have, like, if I didn't have my critic, you know, I wouldn't get anything done, I wouldn't go to work, I'd be a slob, <laughs> I wouldn't get out of bed, you know, and, you know, I, I need those, you know, I'm making fun of it, but it's, you know, basically like, I wouldn't, how would I get through life without this pushing, tyrannical taskmaster? And, you know, you could say, well, that voice might help you to do all those things, you know, I'm not denying that. But what I, more importantly than that is, if that's what you're relying on, then you're strengthening a part of your psyche that's also going to attack you and, and belittle you. And is that, do you want to be strengthening that part of your mind? And I would say that there are other ways to motivate ourselves without the stick, right? You know, we can use inspiration, we can, you know, use meaning and purpose and reflection and, uh, you know, many reasons why we do what we do and 
you know, maybe if you are having to beat yourself with a stick to do them, maybe does, that's worth looking at itself. Like, why do I have to push and be so hard on myself just to do these things? Maybe I don't want to do them. Right? So, um, but the main thing is, you know, just like people say, well, how would I make, how can I make decisions without my critic? How do I know what's right and wrong? Because my critic has a lot of views about right and wrong. And I say, well, you, you know, you can, can listen to the critic, but it's very, it's a, it's a simplistic, you know, it's, it's an early developmental structure that's not very sophisticated. It's developed by the time we're eight. So, um, uh, you know, we have things like conscience and reflection and inquiry that can, that can be much more subtle and nuanced around ethical decision making, for example. So I would invite you to look at other ways to inspire and motivate yourself other than through that kind of the harshness of the, of the judgment. I don't think I need a microphone. Um, you talked a lot about you know, the inner critic of yourself, but a lot of time the criticism is judged, you know, projected outward. It's, yes. Like you said, you're watching people this person, and sometimes perfectionism can take that form as other people are just not doing things right. Uh, right. And, you know, especially, um, it could be national figures or, you know, people in the, in the news. I don't know who you mean, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have some, some specific responses to deal with? Yeah, yeah I have a bunch of... Uh, chapters in the book and practices actually around that because you know it's, it, as I said it's the swing door what goes in goes out what goes out goes in so if we're judgmental here guaranteed we're going to be judgmental out there and um, and again we come back to that question of what do I want to be strengthening right if I'm doing that all day I'm strengthening the critic and it's going to it's going to attack here when there's no one else out there to judge um, and and, if I, and regardless of that, if I am doing that, I'm looking at the world through a particular lens. Negative, fault-finding, it's skewed. It's not, it's not actually objective, it's just critical. And um, which is different than discerning. Right? We want to have that discernment with people and politics and whatnot. Um, and so I actually think a good practice is also to orient the mind to the good. Right? So if, you, if, you're, if you're, you know, sort of a, What's the word? I can't think of the word. Um, like an incessant fault finder, you know, pathological fault finder, practice seeing the good. Practice looking for what's positive. Practice seeing goodness or, or what's healthy or what's beautiful or what's positive or what's constructive. Right? And it's just, it's just the lens we're looking through. Right? But if, you know, mostly we practice the negative one, the critical one. Because it's, and it seems like it's, you know, the brain has a negativity bias, right? Survival, right? We're, we're looking for threat and fear and what's wrong. So that's well developed. We have to actually try harder in a way to look for the positive and the good, which doesn't mean being Pollyannish and, and ignoring what's, you know, what needs our critique, but to also see, especially with people, like, you know, I think it's a good practice. You know, you, you're in a meeting at work, you're walking down the street, you're driving, you're in a line at Safeway. Can you, can you look to the goodness in people? Can you see one positive thing, something that you like, and you just start changing the lens? And it's actually a much happier state to be in. In a similar way that the you know, this Buddhist practice of, of mudita, of appreciative joy, where we celebrate the joy of others. Right? If we can be happy for the happiness of others, as the Dalai Lama said, we increase our chances of happiness by seven billion to one. Right? <laughs> It's the same with looking to the good. Like if, if we can see the good in people, we're increasing our chances of happiness by, you know, seven billion. Because there is a lot of good out there. Um, so that would be one simple practice. Just, you know, but it does require a little effort because we slip into that, that fault finding so easily. Yes, over here, in the front. And yeah, that's good just because people can hear on the, on the uh, video, yeah. Hi, hello, okay. Um, recently I was at a party and I made a cake for this party and it was, it was good. It was a good cake. But I had a real hard- How good was it? Oh, it was really, it was really good. good. Like, yeah. Was it chocolate? No, actually it was called a Kentucky butter cake. Ah. So butter being the operative word there, yeah. 
And um, anyway, and, and a lot of people were like, that cake was so good. And I couldn't accept the compliment. Uh-huh. Is that just conditioning over years of, I'm not good enough, so I don't deserve that? But, you know, we do it as women sometimes. Oh, you look beautiful. Oh, this, I, this is just something I picked up. You know, we can't accept that of right. ourselves because right. is that our inner critic? Just, yeah. You're just conditioning yourself yes. Yes. your whole life? Yes, yes. Who am I? I can't cook. I don't dress well. I don't look beautiful. Right? And it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's very minor in a certain way, but it's indicative of something less minor, you know. And... Um, you know, it's just sad because it's not true, right? Clearly, and it's, this is a great example, right? Reality check, people love the cake. Just let it in. Yeah, it was a great cake. I nailed it, right? <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that, so I, I, I grew up in England where the critic is, has its own different baggage, right? Just, you know, and, um, you know, and, you know it, and, you've, and you've had the most fantastic day ever and someone says, how was your day? And you say, oh, not bad. Not bad. It was all right. You know, you're not allowed to like, yeah, it was great. So when I came to California, it was such a relief that you'd like, if you're having a great day, you say, yeah, it's great. <laughs> so in the same way, like th- there's something very wholesome about like if you do something good, of course, yeah, you can let it in. And if someone compliments you, it's actually a disservice to the other person to not receive it. Someone says, you know, I love, I love how your hair is tonight. I say, thank you. Because you're, you're actually acknowledging their appreciation. Right? Whether your hair is great or not is way less important than the fact that they've expressed appreciation and so you're receiving their appreciation. You're actually honoring their appreciation. That's, that's the important thing. Yeah. So um, that's a great practice to actually just let in when, when people compliment you, say, thank you. That's why I have to say, oh, thank you. And you can have your own internal, but so thank you. And you try and let it in. Yeah. And now we all want some of your butter cake. We want the recipe. <laughs> we want your for dinner. <laughs> wasn't that great? She said that you said, wasn't that great? <laughs> yes. Um, hello. Hi. Um, I don't know if this is as much of a question, but. Um, a lot of times what my inner critic does also is it, it tells me that everyone else doesn't have that problem. Right. You know, it's like everyone yes. else has it figured out. How come you can't figure it out? Right. And, and that also is kind of isolating too because it makes yeah. me feel like, wow, like everyone knows something, I, you know. Right. Um, so I'm just kind of interested is that some, like, yeah. like why that happens or I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um. I mean, I think that's a very common thing that whenever we're suffering, we often think, oh, I'm the only one. You know, I'm the only one who's lonely. I'm the only one who's sad. I'm the only one who's anxious. I'm the only one who's feeling vulnerable or deficient or I'm the only one with a terrible inner critic, right? How many people have an inner critic? Just raise your hand, everybody who, who has an inner critic. Okay, was that everybody? I think I saw most people, right? So, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a way that the critic sort of just turns on the screw, you know, it's a, in a way that's very painful and, and unnecessary. So, and that's why I, when I'm doing my workshops, I have people write the judgments out, I have people share them, I have people talk about them, and people go, oh, I, I'm, and that, it is, it's one of the, it's one of the pieces of the, of the critic, is I'm the only stupid one who hasn't figured this out, right? We judge ourselves for being judgmental. Right? It's the suffering on top of suffering, right? So, yes, very universal. Oh, I just wanted to say the cake was really good. (laughs) And she makes great blondies. Great blondies? Yeah. Um, Yes, you do. All right, look at that. Thank you. (laughs) Great. (laughs) And her hair looks really good tonight. (laughs) (laughs) I'll, 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 I'll get, I'll get, I'll hear this later. <laughs> so uh, I want to ask you something that may, may or not fit. So what happens when, well, I need some um, ideas or solutions when the critic is like a gang member and it just jumps on another situation. It's like, oh, he's down? Oh, I'm going to kick him because he's already down. Mm-hmm. 
So I don't know if y'all can relate to this, but you know, like in the middle of the night, you know, I get to sleep, no, no problem. And in the middle of the night I wake up and maybe something was going on during the day, you know, maybe some incident happened, maybe my kid, something happened to my kid or something happened at work or whatever. And so the light gets turned on because of that. And then the inner critic says, you know, oh, you didn't handle that. Oh, and you made a really bad investment. Oh, and you know, mm -hmm. you, um, you know, you, you did a really bad job, you know, uh, repairing that thing. And oh, and that <laughs> thing, that other thing, and it just starts piling on right. and piling on and piling on. Yeah. And so, and so then I sit, lie there in bed, you know, with all this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, the initial light getting turned on mm -hmm. and all this other stuff, mm -hmm. you know, uh, getting kicked and beaten. And yep. I need solutions for how to get that all turned off. Yeah. Yeah. To get some peace and get back to sleep. Yeah. No, it happens. I mean, it, it does pile it on, you know, and... Um, as you know, as if as if that will help, but it, it, it does pile on, and I think um, you know I think that's where self compassion is really important, right? Because in that moment we're beating ourselves up, we're feeling terrible, we're being raked over the coals for all the other things that we may not have done so well, and um, you know the loving kindness practice, the self compassion. But I would just do the self compassion practice in the simple phrases: May I be free of pain and suffering. May I be free of pain. May I hold myself and my pain with kindness. Right? May I be free of suffering. May I be free of the critic. And you just, it's like you, it's like you, you let the critic stuff be background and you just come to the foreground and you say, may I be at ease. May I love myself as I am. May I forgive myself. May I be free of pain and suffering. And you're just replacing that negative diatribe with something valuable and meaningful. And you do it in a way that's kind and genuine, and you just let that be a, a mantra that quiets that. Because there's no point in picking any of it up. Right? It's, and especially the middle, of, the middle of the night mind state is a very tricky mind state. And it's, it's, it's when we're least resourced, and it, and it will, you know, the, yeah, it's exactly what happens. It just it rolls on itself. So I find loving kindness and self compassion the most helpful at that time. And you just wish yourself well. And you just do it like a, a soothing mantra. You know, so put your hand on your heart. May I be at ease. May I love myself. I'm fine as I am. And just, yeah. So it's, so, so, and it's a way of not engaging. You're not picking up that stuff. You're not trying to rationalize. Well, wait a minute, I did fix the faucet the other day and that work seemed to work, I think. I don't know, I haven't seen the drip. No, just like, you just let it go. You're just not engaging. May I be happy. May I be peaceful. May I Forgive myself, you know, and that you know over time, I think is a really effective practice. Yeah. Okay, last couple of questions, and we're going to wrap up. Yes. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning, different words for regret, or excuse me, different words for this uh, phenomena, and then I, I finally realized that there was a uh, a very subtle feeling that I call regret. And I, I, I wondered how that played into this. How regret relates to the critic? Plays into the critic. Yeah, well, it's definitely one of the outcomes of the critic. Um, so, so and, there's, and I write about it in the, the 2020 hindsight chapter, which is um, when we are, you know, the critic has a, you know, one has 2020 hindsight and therefore will berate us for any things that it perceives that we've done wrong, said wrong, chosen wrongly, right? So, so the natural outflow of that review from the critic is regret. And um, the stronger the critic, the stronger the, 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 the analysis of the past, the more likely we are to regret. Um, because there's some idea in the critic that, the sh that there's a right way and there's a way that you should have done it, right? And there's no real right way. There's just what we did and the outcome, right? And it's not necessarily good or bad, even though it might, we might prefer have gone in a different direction. So it's also understanding that, and a deeper reflection, that there's no ultimately 
good and bad choice. There's just what was chosen and the, and the consequences of that. Um, but I, for the way I work with it is, is trusting that, you know, as, just, as Maya Angelou said, we do the best we can with the information we can and we have to forgive ourselves because it's, it's what's done is done. And the, in the reflection, the, you know, we can, it doesn't mean we don't inquire and reflect and have genuine remorse for things that we've done that are painful to others, say. But the regret, the regret has a, has a flavor of aversion in it where we're not really wanting to look at it and we're judging ourselves, which, just, which actually doesn't allow us to metabolize the experience and move on. Right? The regret holds us, it's like the critics got us by the neck saying, you, you messed up, you messed up, messed up. There's no learning from that. Right? There's just more fear about the future decisions because we might fear the same treatment. Yeah. And, and regret's very sticky. I know I, 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 it's one of my sticky places in myself. And it comes from the critic. It comes from fearing the wrath of the critic's judgment if we make another imperfect decision. So self-forgiveness is really important. And, um, you, know, re you know, genuine reflection on, on, on our actions, but we also have to let go and, and trust that we do the best we can. And it just doesn't work to beat ourselves up about it afterwards. Yeah. We in this room may all have an inner critic, but how do we send one to Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I think I'm going to pass on that question. <laughs> Hi. Um, my experience is that we live in a society that's very driven, you know, by um, negative, you know, messages and, you know, putting ourselves down and all of that. Mm. And I, I've worked real hard at getting a critic to really quiet down. I'm wondering if there's any suggestions besides loving kindness, which I find very helpful, but I'm finding there's a void in terms of how do I get myself moving on things that I don't like to do besides just loving myself, you know. So it's there, like, there's a, there's I'm, a, I'm missing that negative voice that used to kind of, you know, fuel me forward. It's almost like there's a bit of a void there in terms of, so I'm just wondering if there's any other suggestions that you might have in addition to the loving kindness. Uh, the, the, you, so you're missing the voice that encourages you, you said that moves you along? Well, just, you know, I've always, I, I've avoided doing certain things, you uh -huh. know, and I continue even without the negative voice there. Right, so. right. So you're saying, so you're saying in the past that that critical voice would help you confront difficult things? Oh, no, no, things? I don't think it would, but I'm still missing, you know what I mean, something that kind of gets me going on the things that I, the way you put off or procrastinate Yeah, well, on. I just, for me, because I, you know, I think we all do that. We all delay stuff that we don't want to do, the hard stuff. Yeah. I, the way I was I, just curious if there's any Buddhist teachings that really, you know, beyond loving kindness yeah, that yeah, it's are called, helpful it's with called, that. It's called suffering. <laughs> <laughs> it's called... You know, we, we th again, it's, it's that thing, we, we, try, we want to be happy, so we avoid all the things that we think are painful, and we create more suffering, right? And it's only by really looking at that and getting that, and we go, oh yeah, that is really suffering to keep procrastinating all these difficult things that just keep piling up, and I kind of feel anxious in the middle of the night because I haven't done them. I mean, for me, the, I mean, I, and I've, I have that, I've had that pattern as much as anybody else, and one of the ways I do it is I put at the top of my to-do list every day the thing I don't want to do. And I just, I force myself to do it. And it's like, what was the big deal? You know, it's like taxes. Like, who wants to do taxes? And you put them off and you put them off and you put them off and you sort of, it's like always nagging. And you do them, it's like, it's not a big deal. It's just doing some numbers and, you know, you know. So, well, that is also true. But I think, it's, I think you would save yourself a lot of suffering by just having a practice where you put it at the, you know, at the center of your to-do list. I mean, that's how I do it. And, and it, it does, you know, like the phone calls, I don't really want to do that, call that person. I, make, I try and do it the first thing, just get it out the way. And it's it just so, much, so le much less suffering. So reducing suffering is a good motivation. All right, everybody, so thank you very much.